This episode of the Chris Johnston Show is brought to you by Shopify. If you could trade a bench warmer for the GOAT, you'd do it, right? Get your business a game-changing pickup by choosing the commerce platform with the internet's best converting checkout. That's Shopify. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're selling signed sneakers or offering official outfielders outfits, baseball reference, Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform has you covered. And once you've reached your audience, Shopify has the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn them from browsers to buyers. What I love about Shopify personally is how no matter how big you want to take your business, Shopify gives you everything you need to take it to the next level. Shopify, by the way, also powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. And being a truly global force, it powers companies like Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across over 170 countries around the world. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every single step of the way. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash Johnston, all lowercase, shopify.com slash Johnston to take your business to the next level today. Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories, bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show, powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. CJ, I have to admit, I wasn't sure if it was going to get to this point, but we are at this point. Uh, We are recording this podcast moments after we have heard the news of Mike Babcock, uh, the now no longer the Columbus Blue Jackets head coach. He has resigned uh, the tenure with the Blue Jackets lasting just under two months. This comes less than a week after allegations surface about him taking players' photos, putting them up on the big screen TV in his coaching office. Uh, Those allegations were surfaced through the Spit and Chicklets podcast by Paul Bissonnette, and now we are here. CJ, how did we get here? Let's let's talk about how we got to this point where Mike Babcock no longer has a job. Well, let me start by saying there's a lot of people right now that are surprised that we're here. I think that... um, You know, clearly to to make the kind of hiring the Blue Jackets did in July to put their faith in Mike Babcock and for him not even to to see the end of the prospects tournament, not even, you know, ever lead the team in a practice or open a training camp or coach a game. I mean, this is a highly unusual set of circumstances. And I think it's important for us to to focus on the facts. And, And, you know, admittedly, we do not have all the facts in this circumstance. I mean, we know that the NHL Players Association met uh, with players in Columbus, they shared those findings with the league. We talked about that late last week, but you know it does sound as though there was one player in particular that that brought forward um, some concerns about his dealings with Mike Babcock. But ultimately, you know, this is a resignation. This is something where Mike Babcock and and Blue Jackets management had a lot of conversations, uh, you know, leading up to to figuring out what they're going to do, and they decide to go their separate ways, you know without knowing the extent of the allegations, what happened, I think that there's a lot of people drawing a lot of conclusions. You know, one thing that my mind goes to though, in this case is that it just got to a point where it was going to be impossible for him to go in that dressing room with any credibility for him to lead the team. I think that, that, you know, from the, the, the organization standpoint, I mean, you, you don't get to this point where you're negotiating an exit with a head coach before he's even coached a game very lightly. Right. I mean, this, this is a, this is a sign of something that's gone totally wrong. And so, you know, it's, it was a strange story. If you remember initially, Julian, you know, after the, the, the initial allegations on spit and chicklets were about an interaction with Boone Jenner, the jackets captain. I mean, that was that, that, that fire, if you want to call it was put out within six hours because Boone Jenner came forward and said that, yes, he, he, you know, had a meeting with Mike Babcock, but he had no issue with, with what went on in that meeting. Um, But clearly he, you know, that doesn't mean that there weren't other issues with, with some of his teammates or at least with one of his teammates. And ultimately, I think that, that everyone looked at this, 
likely Mike Babcock included. I mean, reading between the lines of the statement he put out on Sunday night as part of this announcement, you know, you almost get the sense, you know, he doesn't need this at this point that the, the organization decided they don't need this. And, you know, there's, there's a lot, I think, that we can kind of zoom in on because I think there's a lot of moving parts to this story. As much as it started with one specific allegation, you know, it ends up where, you know, the, the Blue Jackets, quite frankly, were looking to, to bring in a veteran head coach to, to push themselves up the standings. And, and so to, to wind up a couple of days before training camp, having this happen, I mean, this, this is a disaster on a number of fronts. Let me read the statement uh, Mike Babcock put out uh, through the team. Upon reflection, it has become clear that continuing as head coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets was going to be too much of a distraction. While I'm disappointed to have not had the opportunity to continue the work we've begun, I know it's in the best interest of the organization for me to step away at this time. I wish everyone in the organization well in the upcoming season. When we talked about this topic last, I had brought the fact that, okay, there were some players who said it wasn't a big deal. And in my mind, I had not heard, okay, this player say this wasn't this was uncomfortable. This player said it wasn't comfortable. Clearly, in the last few days, enough players spoke to the NHLPA and made those feelings heard in this case. I'm I'm curious if it was younger players. I'm curious what other players in that locker room just said, hey, this isn't a, a good look. I, I don't like this. I don't feel comfortable. I, I I know we don't have all the facts. I'm just curious. My my mind immediately goes to that point of this entire story. I wonder who eventually expressed uh, just concerns about all of that. Well, it does sound like it was a younger player, at least one um, that, that had some concerns or, or issues or was uncomfortable with, with, with uh, dealing with Mike Babcock uh, as opposed to some of the veterans, right? I mean, we heard Johnny Goudreau address this uh, to some of our colleagues that were at the NHL media tour in Vegas. You know, we had the Boone Jenner statement, you know, it doesn't seem as though this was driven by the, the sort of more veteran players, we'll call it, inside that Blue Jackets dressing room. I think it was, you know, maybe players that, that haven't quite arrived to the NHL or, or in the earlier stages that, that you know, brought forward some issues here. And, and you know, but I, I think it's kind of noteworthy if we go over the timeline of events that, you know, the organization went to a prospect tournament in Traverse City, Michigan, um, a couple days after the initial reports or allegations surfaced. You know, they brought Mike Babcock with them. He was seen at the first game there uh, that the team played. I think where they started to gain a little bit more speculation or, or heat is, you know, they, they played games you know on Saturday and Sunday in which, you know, the reporters in the building, you know, said that Mike Babcock wasn't among those that were in attendance all of a sudden with the, this sort of Blue Jackets crew. But, I mean, they, they were operating as recently as the start of this weekend as though he was still their head coach, right? And so, um, you know, it's it's – I think that that ultimately, if you're in the, the spot the Blue Jackets are as an organization, if you even have a question, if you have one question in your mind about whether, you know, you could send Mike Babcock in as your head coach and still expect him to get the results that that you know you hired him to get, and you you're at this stage, right? I mean, they they have Adam Fantilli. You know, he actually scored a hat trick in in one of the the prospect games that were played in Traverse City over the weekend. But number two overall draft pick, obviously a very important player for this organization, they hope for the next 15 years. I mean, they have other prospects because they have been a team in, in recent years at the bottom of the standings. You know, this is going to probably be a younger ish roster, uh, you know, given where they're at in their cycle. And so, you know, I think that all that factors in to some degree, but you know, it's, it's a hard one for us to, you know, I want to be very careful here because, you know, this is a very sensitive story. And because of that sensitivity, I can tell you quite frankly, there's not a lot of people saying too much about it. You know, the principles involved here, you know, we have this statement from the Blue Jackets, but are, are really not. This isn't this isn't like a trade where you know there's a lot of people maybe giving you background on the side. I think everyone's very careful in this point, and you know, so it's it's hard to have a full picture into what happened beyond I think you know what did become clear though probably on both sides quite honestly is that this just was an untenable situation. You know where it got to. I mean, you can't. It was a couple days of open speculation with Mike Babcock of, of thinking of the things he's done of you know, reflecting on or, or discussing some of what's happened in the past. And, you know, you go back to the original sin here, right? The original sin, I would argue, was hiring him. And, you know, you, someone might sit here and say, well, that's, you know, it's easy with the benefit of hindsight. I mean, I think that there was enough people, myself included, that that made that observation, you know, back in June when it first surfaced that he was going to be their head coach, and that there was a lot of risk with that that call, that decision. 
you know, at a really important time for this organization, I should add too. I mean, with, with them, you know, having bottomed out and trying to, to work their way back into, you know, a spot where they will be a playoff team and what they hope eventually will be a championship caliber team. I mean, th- this was an important hire and, and, you know, it, it feels like it didn't really have much of a chance from the beginning, I think because of some of the, Mike Babcock's past and, and, you know, what we learned about the Blue Jackets here, right. They, they, they didn't really have his back ultimately. I mean, I'm not arguing they should have, but clearly there's, you know, before they've even seen him coach a practice or all the things I mentioned earlier, you know, they've got to a point where they wanted to move on from him as well. This was a mutual decision. And so I think that, that, that kind of underlines that this really was a, a mistake from, from the beginning. And I don't, I don't think it ever had any chance to succeed quite honestly. I just, I think that, it was the wrong hire and, and the wrong thing. And, um, you know, it lasted 78 days when all was said and done. This lasted shorter. And I, and I get that I'm making this analogy and people are going to look at it as a joke, but it's lasted longer. No, this was shorter than the supposedly Kim Kardashian, uh, Chris Humphreys marriage or whatever. And I'm not just bringing this up to make a joke here. This is just a ridiculous situation. If you're going to get to this point where you realize, as you said, CJ, it's not worth having this person's back. What was the point of hiring him in the first place? We have discussed Mike Babcock on this podcast and how he might not have done the work to warrant getting a second chance. Why would Columbus think this person was worth going through all of this trouble for and then to have it blow up in their face spectacularly before training camp starts? The Columbus Blue Jackets should have egg on their face for this. And then you have a whole statement that goes out where, hey, maybe it was fine for Boone Jenner and for Mike Babcock between those two. But clearly, there were players in that organization who were not a fan of that particular situation, and they felt uncomfortable, and it's led to this. It's embarrassing for this organization. I know we'll talk more about Yarmo Kekalainen and what could be next for him later on in the show. But right now, if you're the Columbus Blue Jackets, if you're John Davidson, if you're everyone in that organization, you should feel embarrassed that the fact that it has come to this situation. Mike Babcock was clearly not worth the risk, and it has blown up spectacularly in their face it's embarrassing for the organization as far as i'm concerned well all i can really do is point you to the comments from yarmo kekalein and the general manager when they hired mike babcock i mean it seemed clear in in what he told reporters that day that that he was comfortable that that mike had you know reflected properly on his his previous you know times in the nhl that he had done the work to borrow your phrase that that he was ready to lead the team forward and and Yet here we get, he really hasn't had a chance to lead the team. I mean, obviously over these, these ensuing months, there's been an opportunity for him to meet with players. This is where the original allegations come from and start those, those conversations in that process. But you know, never even got a chance to coach the team. I mean, it, 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 it is embarrassing. I don't think there's any other way to put it. If you're, you know, looking at this from the blue jackets side of things and, and, you know, they, they felt he was ready that he deserved the chance that he had earned another contract. And, and obviously when you say, why did they get to that point? I mean, I, we're not in that decision, but I think it's fair to assume that, that Mike Babcock's resume of winning is, is, was a huge driving force for this. I mean, he's someone, um, you know, for better or for worse, I mean, is, is his track record speaks for itself. Uh, and he's, he's dragged a lot out of his teams. And I think that they felt, especially after last season, that, that things went so wrong there in Columbus. It was just such – it was basically a lost year for the, for the organization. that They needed someone to push some buttons. But, um, you know, it's, it's a big mistake. And, you know, the irony of it all, maybe they end up with the right coach in the end. I mean, Pascal Vincent, who's, who's going to take over as the head coach now, who has been the associate coach in Columbus for a couple of years already, you know, is, is – he's not young per se, early 50s, but, but this is his first chance as an NHL head coach. And, and – you know, is seen kind of as as someone who I think has had he's had sort of a, a hype around him, a small hype around him in the last couple of years that he could be a good NHL head coach. And strange as these things work out, maybe they maybe they with the wrong process, you know, end up where they should have been to begin with. I just want to read uh, an excerpt from Elliot Friedman's reporting on this. Uh, according to multiple sources, one of the most serious concerns was a meeting that occurred away from team facilities that included several minutes of looking through a phone. The 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 initial thing at hand here was that Mike Babcock wanted to see players' photos of their families uh, through the phone, and the photos would get shown up on the screen in his office. And we we discussed on our last episode if that was just just if if this was another coach, maybe we would dismiss that because they don't have that same background as Mike Babcock does. 
But seeing this particular nugget from Elliot Friedman, you're just like, what? Like, why are you doing this? Why are you? Why do you need to have that power over a player, whether young or old, going through their phone? I it just doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, to reiterate a point I made earlier about how Mike Babcock doesn't seem as if he's really atoned for the past transgressions, but despite getting that job, I don't know. This doesn't tell me that he's learned that much. I don't. I don't. It just bl- kind of blew my mind, CJ, and I just think it's a ridiculous thing. Right, and and look, it it's possible that that Mike Babcock himself didn't see a problem with this, right? It's possible that he didn't think this was something that you know that that's that's where you get into is he you know the, is there a generational divide here? Is there something that isn't clicking? I mean, clearly privacy is very important, and you know at the end of the day you know, you're, you're trying to keep your athletes comfortable. If they say they're not comfortable, I think that then you have to, to look at at what led them there. And, you know, I would imagine there's a lot of coaches around the league looking at this and, and, you know, I'm not saying that other teams would have necessarily done this. I mean, I do think stuff like this has happened. I, I certainly know this is, you know, that there are other teams that try to include family as a way of team building, as getting to know each other. Uh, I'm not saying that it goes down in the same way that it went down here. And I think, some of that context, which, which, you know, we're missing the specific details of, but, but is important. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, a lot of people are going to, are saying this doesn't surprise them. Right. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't really hear a lot of, I, just, I don't, I don't, we didn't hear it in that, that three and a half years that the times that Mike Babcock spoke, you know, a lot of evidence that, that he felt that he needed to change. You know, I, I think that he addressed it somewhat in that, that series of articles he did with NHL.com. Um, but, you know, didn't, didn't go the whole way. And, and, you know, I'll revert to something I said in our last episode. I, I think that he was starting this job with two strikes or two and a half strikes. I mean, there, there was no margin for error. And, and at the first sign of trouble, look, where, look what happens. I mean, the, the team's moving on from him pretty quickly and um, you know, He's this is I would I would venture to say this is the last time we'll see him associated in a formal way with an NHL team in a formal way with an NHL team. Does that mean we won't see him at all associated with an NHL team or will some NHL team try to have him as some kind of senior advisor? Do you see that scenario pointing out where some team says they want Mike Babcock in some capacity, just not as a head coach? Well, not anytime soon. You know, I, I don't think that that's something I can't imagine something he wants any part of at this stage and they would want any part of, you know, I, I can't, I can't see 10 years down the road and, and, you know, how everyone might be viewing all this and what might happen. And, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say 100% never. Um, but, but certainly I, I'm confident in, in thinking and saying that, that he's coached his last NHL game and, you know, we'll see over time, you know, how, how things are viewed and, and, what happens between then and now, but you know, he, if you remember Julian, he, he more or less disappeared after, you know, getting fired in Toronto. I mean, really for someone who was very front and center in the media during his four plus years as the Maple Leafs head coach, you know, he, he was very quickly onto his other passions, pursuits, not, not in the public eye at all. And, you know, I, I would think that you're going to see something similar here for, uh, for Mike. Let's do a quick, uh, you can bet that, and then I want to continue this, this discussion with regards to Yarmo Kekalainen and, and maybe a little bit about Pascal Vincent as well. You can bet that with David Bastel. Brought to you by Sports Interaction. Get in the action and make a play. 19 plus, please play responsibly. A bit of a heavier episode today, but we still have You Can Bet That. Remember to hit up sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all of your gaming needs. CJ, on the Sports Interaction website, uh, they have some different prop bets. Uh, they're looking at regular season goalie wins. In particular, Ilya Samsonov is there. The puck line for him, 32 and a half. If you're taking the under, odds are at 1.84. If you're taking the over, 1.90. How do you think Ilya Samsonov will look this season? Interesting that they set the bar there, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I have no reason to believe that you're going to see a huge fall off from Samsonov, but the question is really for me, how many games is he going to play? Uh, you know, that that will be a key factor in how many wins he ultimately ends up with. Um, you know, he's not been someone who's, who's really ever handled what we might call a number one or even 1A 
workload uh, over his career. You know, even last season, there were stretches when, when he was out injured for Toronto. The, the Leafs mixed starts between a few different players, including Matt Murray. Um, and, and, you know, Samsonov ends up logging the most amount of games, but only by a small amount. And so to win 32 games, I mean, you probably got to play something close to 50, maybe 55. Um, you know, I, I would lean towards the under there, if I'm being honest, and really not because I'm forecasting a, a terrible season. I just don't know how many games he's going to play and if he'll play enough to get the, that number of wins. I'm curious about that as well. I might also be leaning towards the under. You can find the full list of goalies on the Sports Interaction website. Don't forget to check it out for all the best odds before game, in game, and the best props. That is sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. I'll say it one more time for good measure. Sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. CJ, when we were talking about this story in the group chat as it was unfolding, uh, you noticed that uh, Jarmo Kekalainen uh, was able to speak about this through the team statement. Uh, no John Davidson, the team president. I, there are a lot of people right now who are wondering about Yarmo's future with the organization. What do you think it should be in light of what has happened? Well, I mean, I think that we're all wondering if that's the next shoe to drop. And, and you know, it's pretty evident coming through this. I mean, if Yarmo Kekalainen is, is the one making the statement on behalf of the Blue Jackets, you know, in announcing this news, you know, it sounds to me like he's still the GM of the team and I, I don't have any reason uh, or information that suggests that's about to change. But, you know, certainly I think this, there, you know, he was viewed as a GM that, you know, had to get some results out of his team. You know, he was the one ultimately who was responsible for hiring Mike Babcock. And, and you know, on this day, he's, he's responsible as, as Mike Babcock is resigning from the organization as well. And so, you know, I, I do think it's fair to wonder what the, the longer term ramifications of all this will be. Um, as, as I said earlier, though, I mean, if there's there's a world maybe because sports are unpredictable and you don't know what's going to happen where this all takes off in a positive direction under Pascal Vincent. And, and, and it's not maybe the same discussion point uh, about the Blue Jackets and, and Kekalainen. But, you know, certainly I think that this, you know, how these next few weeks go will, will be important. You know, this is this is a pretty major change to be happening. I mean, I can't underline enough the fact that training camp essentially opens on Wednesday or you know on ice on Thursday, and on Sunday night that the Blue Jackets are making this kind of announcement. You know, they're going to have a media day on Monday and discuss it all. You know, th this is not the way you want to start a season in, in any of the 32 markets in the league. And I think for one, where this organization really needs to take a step forward, where, where you're curious how you know someone like Adam Fantilli performs this year. Um, you know, creating the right environment for those players to to learn and to to find their way in the NHL is important. And, you know, that that didn't happen with the hiring of Mike Babcock. So, you know, I, I, I do think that there there's going to be questions and, and focus on that and, and and rightfully so. And I'll tell you this, when you when you get a story this big of this magnitude and, and you see those statements, you know, the quotes themselves aren't necessarily exciting, but I can tell you that there's no there's no coincidences or just afterthoughts. I mean, it, there, there was definitely the potential there where you could have had the president of the team, John Davidson, be the one to, to maybe weigh in on that. There, there would have been thought put behind, you know, what was said there, you know, how it, how it comes across and the fact that it was, you know, Yarmo Kekalina getting attributed with that quote. And so, you know, I, I think to me, that's a signal that he's very closely tied to everything that happened. And, you know, we'll see, if there's anything he can do here in managing this team out of this, so to speak, and, and trying to, to set things right and have a good training camp and get off to a good start in the year and create the right environment. And, and I would suggest to you that if that doesn't happen, that, you know, a lot of pointed questions will be directed at his way. As they should. I, I think when you make a move like what Yarmo did, uh, it, it, there's some desperation involved. This is a team that is trying to make the playoffs uh, they've made all these acquisitions over the last little bit. I know they had the injury plagued last season that they had and Brad Larson didn't work, but say what you want about Mike Babcock's track record. When you consider everything else that had gone on with him, it was a very desperate move. And the fact that it blew up in the team's face, I think there's every right for people to wonder or not whether it Jarmo should continue to have his job. And initially before we started recording, I was leaning towards him being fired too. And I was very surprised uh, at least when the announcement came out with uh, Mike Babcock resigning, that Yarma was still there. As I think if you're making a decision like that, you essentially have to stick your neck out for this person and justify 
why uh, he should be there. And, and we've talked about it already in this podcast that he has, that Yarmo did feel that Mike Babcock had changed at least in some way. So I was surprised that Yarmo Kekalainen at least as we're recording right now, is still working as the GM of this team. This guy has been in his post since February 13th, 2013. It's been almost over 10 years since Jarmo Kekalainen was named general manager of this organization. If he had been let go, you know, it wouldn't have been that much of a surprise. You look at where the Blue Jackets are at, you think, okay, they have Adam Fantilli, you get someone new in charge, you you go into a completely new direction. So I am a bit surprised. Uh, And I wonder how much of a leash he will get for this upcoming season. I, I'm i very surprised he's still in his job right now. It's got to be a short lease. I mean, let's remember too, though, this, these are big decisions and, and they're unfolding in real time and a lot's moving. And, and you know, it's last Tuesday that this initially, the allegations surfaced. It seems by Wednesday initially that, that everything is fine, that, you know, it's the players that were initially spoken to. There's no issues. Then, you know, more comes to light. By Friday, there's a meeting at the league office, you know, the Blue Jackets themselves are in Traverse City with their prospects. I mean, this 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 happened very fast, and and so, you know, I would say that the one thing in, in him, you know, when his, his job status is, it's a lot to change a head coach at this stage. It's also a lot to to maybe change a general manager in in full course. I mean, there might have to be a little bit more. I think due diligence probably at the ownership level, uh, and just is basically evaluating what exactly happened here. Where were the errors made? I mean, it's one thing for us to sit on a podcast and say, well, you shouldn't have hired him. I mean, I think I think that, first of all, I think it's a fair take, but it's also an easy take for those of us on the outside. I think on the inside, fair. there have to be some some real, you know, some really looking at at how they got to that point, who's responsible for it, how the decisions were made here in the last few days. Um, you know, again, this is a resignation. It wasn't a firing. Lots of coaches get fired. And let's be clear, there, there was the ability to fire Mike Babcock. I mean, the, that that's a part of the job. And, and, you know, for whatever reason, that wasn't the case. Um, but, but I guess my point is, is, is I think it's a little too soon for us to say with any definitive confidence, you know, what's going to happen at the management level. You know, this was already a hot GM's chair too. I mean, I, I think that you're right to call it a, a sort of a desperate risky move to bring in Mike Babcock. I mean, it was only a two-year contract for Babcock, remember. Uh, so it was, it was brought in really for short-term results, you know, a short-term coach late in his career um you know trying to get a specific reaction from the team and you know i think that was a sign too that that you know probably that in the management office there isn't this feeling that they just have forever here to to kind of get things on track and so you know i i do think the leash would be incredibly short coming out of you know a, a pretty turbulent start to their training camp and you know columbus is one of the, the sort of smaller quieter markets in the league i mean what a what a fascinating next few weeks they're in for with that team that, that I don't think any of us look on paper. I mean, they, they certainly got better. They, they traded for some NHL players and they, they've brought in a, you know, they've got a few young players, I think with legitimate, you know, talent and ability to become difference makers over time. But, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot to try to bring that group together. I think after everything that's happened here and, and I think they have to rebuild some trust, right. I mean, in, within their own dressing room um, and, and maybe they can't do it. I mean, it, I, I don't know how that's going to go. So I think, yes, this is, this is now squarely on, on the GM and, and, you know, it's a GM that's been there a long time. 10 years is a, is an extremely long tenure in, in what can be a difficult job. And, you know, whether he gets to 11 and 12 and 13, I think is very much an open question. I, I have questions about Yarmo in his spot and I have a weird feeling. We're not, this is not the last we talk about the Columbus blue jackets. Uh, I know we're running short on time. The only other thing I'll say is, uh, Pascal Vincent has a track has a track record proceeding of coaching in the minors and in the Jets organization. And it seems as if in hockey circles, a lot of people would be happy for him to get this job, obviously coming through in some unfortunate circumstances with the Mike Babcock situation, but it seems like it was a long time coming for him. It was. And, and you know, I, I think there's a real opportunity for him. I mean, look, most people, when they get their first NHL job, it, it's never under good circumstances. Usually you're taking over a team that's underperformed or something's gone wrong. Um, you know, it, you don't get hired when the team's, you know, perfectly ready to win and everything's been humming along smoothly, at least not, not too often. Now this is at the extreme end of that. I mean, until two days ago, he was, you know, going to be an associate coach on Mike Babcock's staff. He was working very close, of course, with Babcock over the summer, as, as you would expect and the coaching staff. And so, you know, pretty, pretty quick uh, change of, of view for Vincent. But I do think it, it will 
serve him well that he's been with the organization, you know, would, would obviously have established relationships with the, the, the more veteran players. And, you know, look, if you're him, you almost have to think, what do you have to lose? I mean, I, I don't think anyone's ex- expecting them to succeed in the near future, especially after, you know, everything that's gone on here. Um, but, you know, w- would not be surprising if, if this turns out to be a great thing for him and the Blue Jackets. But, you know, it might still take some time. I mean, I don't think we can look at October or November and, and put this on the new head coach or, you know, at, at any point. He got a two-year contract, though, from the Blue Jackets. So there's a bit of window or a runway for him to establish himself. And, um, you know, when one door closes, another one opens. And this is a great opportunity for someone who's waited a long time to take over an NHL team. Ask CJ will be on Thursday as opposed to today, and that's when we'll have our next episode. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long and peace. This concludes our emergency CJ Show episode. Thanks for tuning in. The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.